Hey everyone, good afternoon. So, my topic is how to understand the user behavior using multilinear regression. So, we have sort of heard a lot of uh, talks which tells that this can be done as a product, this is what a feature a user might like, or are solving other different problems. But there remains a very fundamental problem with the product companies that what are the features that we should develop that brings the maximum value for the user, for my company, and for the business. Probably, when you sit down and think of an app that I want to build this app, this is going to be hit. You might probably jot down 1000 points that okay, we can build this, but what should be the next immediate feature that will bring you the maximum value? because we have limited resources in our companies. So th after this talk, we might have a system which can solve this problem for most of the product companies. What to expect in the talk is we'll learn how to learn about our audience. We'll learn how to collect and process data. We'll learn about what is multiple linear regression, which most of you might know now. What is backward and forward elimination? Why, why, why I have written here random forest and what an example that is of finding the best flight, which comes from my domain. For the last two topics, it will be a very casual talk and a less of a PPT. Something about me. My name, Sarthak Deshwal, as my introduction. I work at Expedia Group. I'm the part of the mobile team. I'm a Python enthusiast and have been coding for in Python for last around six years. And I'm also a machine learning enthusiast and take a different lessons and lectures in machine learning in India. Let's start the first thing, understanding our audience. So before that, Let's do an activity inside the room. Let's understand you. How many of you are students? Please raise the hands up. How many of you are working in a product-based company? Hands up. How many of us are working in a service-based company? So within this group we have seen there's the most basic three types of people we can gener uh, gather here there were students and then there were professionals the professionals were either in a product based company or a service based company then among now i can go that who all live from in singapore who come from in southeast asia and there can be very very high demarcations and every user might have different needs and there is not a good yes answer to every need. We need to figure out that what is that most important need for my user. So why it matters, it tells you exactly who your primary demographic is, who you should target to generate the maximum value. What features should you build? In what order should they be built? The order is the most important key part when you're building a successful product-based company. And are you on the right track? Are you, you are delivering features, but your engagement, your app metrics are not going up. Why? And how you can do that? You can track the user events on various events, places, actions throughout next Throughout the talk, we'll use events, but they can be actions on your website, on your app, on your product, and use various analytical tools that we have to understand the user behavior and their pain points. So how do we collect data? Simple, we just make fire and forget calls throughout our applications. I will be using products or website and apps interchangeably. So we use fire and forget calls. Most of you might know what are fire and forget call, but just to recall, we do not worry about the response. 
should happen asynchronously. Your app should not get halted at any point of time when you are making such type of calls and should not impact the performance. These calls should be so light, the data should be so discreet, so small that it doesn't affect anything. The, your app experience should be smooth. This should not be bottleneck at any given point of time. So through your website, app, or any other product which is online, you should dump the user events, behaviors into the database. The only catch here is that you will generate, but you have to tie the user journey throughout the app. So how we can do this is by assigning a unique identification to the user for the session. We are not identifying the user through a username. We are assigning a unique identification number in for that session. And after that session expires, that unique identifier should get expired. So next is a little basics that we should know that what is a variable. It is a characteristic of an item or individual like gender, number of family members, income, height, or anything. Then we have data. So about variable, we have data. For example, what is the gender? It's a male or it's a female. So that becomes a variable. Now the data about the height of the female, of the gender, that is this much height. Then we convert this data to statistics. You cannot tell the user that, that okay, I, I have uh, this, this, these are my users, and this user have five, five inch, uh, five feet two inch height. This have one seventy centimeter height. You can't go on keeping saying numbers. You have to statistically analyze it and tell the user or the product manager or someone you want to represent this data in a statistical way. Now, seeing this graph, it looks very nice, and we can very easily analyze that. Okay, most of the female gender people are of the height of six feet one inch. This is the most important part of this talk. We'll come back to this slide repeatedly. This is how things go in a product company. We have, uh, companies have analytics, in engineering, or big data team. What they will do is, whatever the data which we stored, they'll write queries to get that data. This is data. Then they will make the sense out of data. Uh, they will convert the raw numbers into knowledge, that is converting data into some meaningful way. And then they might use some business intelligence tools to get to easy understand a report. Like they will, con so data, then we have information, and then we have knowledge. So these are the three things that a team will do. Then this part will be given to the product manager. On the basis of that knowledge collected, the product manager will understand the pain points in the app flow. We'll decide which features are to be worked on immediately and will work on or around that feature. And then the data will again come to the system when we have made the changes. And then that data will again convert it to information, knowledge, and come back to the product manager. So it's a complete cycle. But there's a flaw here, and we can optimize this part. With machine learning tools at our disposal, we should focus our energy on creative work and leave the data should to machine. The part where we say that the knowledge part, or to find the pain points, it should not be the part of a human being. Human being should write the code, and that repetitive part should be done automatically and product managers should find out creative ideas around the pain points. So you all know this right now. These are the just basic terms. We'll move to the next slide that is multiple linear regression. Basic mathematics that what is multiple linear regression? You have multiple variables. One thing to understand is that when you are capturing actions in the app, make sure that each event, each action on the app is independent of other. And you should notice that what is your app metric? Is it engagement with the user? Is it money that you are making through your app? 
or is it some other thing and the th the focus should on be increasing the revenue increasing the app metric enhancing that app metric so y1 is the independent variable which we are trying to predict that can be your revenue or your app engagement uh, xi are the independent variables are simply what you are logging to the system so dependent and independent variables as i have discussed so what happens is when you are collecting data everything is not numeric like if i come from my domain and i i am logging things i will figure out so i come from a company which sells travel so if you when you search for flights you put to and from like you want to travel from new york to paris so i cannot convert new york to paris to numbers directly so we have to collect some sort of textual data throughout our app also we are not only collecting the data through tracking we have you seen there are short surveys on the websites when you go to the website like was this information useful to you so such type of information is also collected and sometimes comments also come or sometimes you just have to figure out that discrete values these are not comments we are not going into text analytics but they are strings and they are not numerical data and we cannot convert them to directly a numerical data reason being suppose i i when i was recording it i found that one of the data set i have block kampong and this data was collected in the system there's an issue with it machine can understand it i can convert it to numeric data i can just put them with ids like 1 2 3 that is also not possible reason being that when i'll put to it to multiple uh, multiple linear regression it will sort of try to figure out the relations between number like 2 is higher than 3 3 or something like that and it won't be useful we we know that there is no numeric relationship between delhi and new york city they are not like it is good it is bad there there is no such sorry uh so that is not the case so what is the solution create dummy variables what we are going to do is we are going to increase the dimensions of our data we are going to convert delhi new york kampong from the columnar data to the row data as you can see like we made delhi new york kampong and we just put one like it's like one code encoding which we have studied earlier there is a problem associated with it and that is called computational problems what if i tell you there are airports throughout the world and this is just a field like we i have a to and a from field from where to where i am flying and then i have the combinations and their combinations are n square this has serious limitations but because we are using multiple linear regression and that's a simple calculation it's bearable so when we have this what we'll do is we'll now try to figure out what is the most important feature to work on what we'll do is we'll set a confidence value we'll set up a p value we will run backward forward elimination or also known as bidirectional elimination in our system we'll get one variable right now that is the most important factor in our app value metric so one thing to understand is if one of the variable has become perfect or either user is not using it it becomes non trivial it won't affect my results and that will be eliminated so you will find that one variable that is most important in my, in my app and will work on that on that metric will build features to around that metric okay this, let's say on the click of a button on a click of this button okay when the user clicks on this button it's good what can i do to make the user click this button that is the problem now product manager has to solve and that's the creative work we can do so what is the p value the confidence value 
While testing the hypothesis, this tells the significance of the results. The term null hypothesis is a general statement or default position that there is no relationship between two measured phenomena or no association among groups. This is more of a text based. Let's take an example. But before that, how many people know what a confidence value is? So, most of the so let's say a girl thinks, it comes up with a hypothesis that if I add soda to my water and give that water to the plants, plants, plants will grow rapidly. That is, it's her hypothesis. And so what she'll do is she will do a controlled experiment. To the 50% of the plants, she will say that, okay, I'm giving the normal water and to other 50% of the plants, she will say that I'm giving a soda water. What happens? She will come to a result that, okay, is it making any change or is, is it not making any change? And that probability mat matrix, then when you want to say that this hypothesis worked or not, is your confidence value. That your null, it's the p-value or a probability value is the probability of given statistical model that when the null hypothesis is true. Smaller the p-value, the more strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So as I talked about, about the bidirectional elimination, so there are two types of elimination that we are going to make, and we, then we are going to make it a hybrid thing. This is called the forward elimination. We select a p-value, like say, when starting the system in the beginning, we'll select, we'll decide on a p-value, let's say 0 0.05. Then we'll fit all, well, simple regression models for every subset of the input data that we have taken. We'll select the one with the lowest p-value. We'll keep that variable and fit all possible models with one extra predictor and add the ones you already have. Then we'll again consider the variable with the lowest p-value. And we'll repeat this process. We'll keep on doing this process until that one variable is left that we are concerned about. So this is what was forward elimination then we have is backward elimination. And I quickly wrote the code for it. I see if this cannot come here. I'll see if this can come here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So simple stuff. I imported the libraries. I imported my data set. I used one hot encoder, I used label encoder, and things like that. And then I sp split my data set, okay, sorry. Then I split my data set, and I trained my model, I, let's regress a dot fit. Then I predicted the values, now comes the interesting part, the backward elimination function. What it does is, it checks for the lowest p-value, eliminates it checks it, eliminates, and then return the x that is happening only one variable. That is going to be only one variable right now. So you get that we had a forward elimination, then we had a backward elimination. Now we come to a hybrid approach where we say, OK, we'll run backward and forward, and we'll see which variable comes up, and we'll build the features around this variable. Now, the second question, product manager will come with n number of things and number of features that should be built. Which feature should be picked up first? And there is no easy answer to it, but there's a thing called that our team is the customer of our app. We, if you are building the app, you are also the customer of the app. So we can record the data from your team in this form. And this thing won't come immediately. It will take time. But once you have started collecting such type of data and you have, you have in your system, then you can start using it. And you will know that which feature is going to work. So what you do is you record the data. What you record is every pers person that is involved in that feature, you take two parameters from them on any scale you like. That is, what is their effort? in this feature and what is their confidence in this feature? 
how confident are they that if this feature gets built, will they like it? And how much effort are they going to put it? Because we should take the low-hanging fruits first before going to any comp making any complex things. The base should be strong enough that we can build anything over that. So we, ha so we have as like product manager effort, product manager confidence. What is the market confidence? The there can be a short surveys about the features, which we call smoke test. That you put a button over there that this feature is coming soon, and you analyze that how many people are going to use that button, how many users are interested in such type of features. Then you have his designing effort, you have his designer confidence. Then when you go to the engineering team, they might tell you that, OK, the feature looks nice, but it's very hard for me to build now. It might take another one year to build this. Will in next one year this feature still be relevant? That's the sort of questions that can be answered through this. When you have this, you run the system again. And now you find out which feature should we work on? So this data, this part of data, is coming within the team. And it will take some time to build. But once you build it, it's going to be quite useful and quite intuitive. So let's get back to the slide, which I told you is the most important slide. To get the data, yes, that's our now data pipeline. We are getting the data. Then we are running machine learning algorithms to find out, to make the knowledge out of that data. And we have come to the point where we know what's the most important metric, what is the most important feature, uh, what is the most important thing we should be working on around the factor which should be working on. Then the product manager will come that, OK, I have this n number of features with me. And now, what do you want? To, then we take that sort of survey that I showed you, and then we again. And so we know that one most important feature that should that we should work right now and will have the maximum profit in terms of app engagement or revenue for our company. So, so that this complete pipeline has now been reduced to a very certain values. And the engineers which were involved in getting the data and making sense out of it can now work on other engineering efforts that is going out in the team. And we can build more features in a less time. So the problem that this solves is the human resource problem. We have limited number of engineers. We have lim limited number amount of time. And we want to build great features for our users. So because we are tracking the users, we should know what is the general data protection regulations. And okay. So how many knows what a GDPR here is? And what I'm doing right now here is, is it compliant with GDPR? And what I'm doing right now here is, is it compliant with GDPR or not? It is. We have to. So GDPR says that the anonymity of the user must be maintained till the end. I must not be able to uniquely identify the user through my data. What I'm telling you is that I create the unique user identification for the session. I never create it for the co complete session. I don't tie it to my user's email ID or anything. It's just for that session. And it is required because I need to tie the user journey throughout my product. It, it cannot be the case that user was on this page, and then it landed on this page, and I start logging it again as a new user. That will make my data dirty. So we what we do is we create the unique identifier for the session. And we do not tie it with any of the user information. It's completely anonymous, and it never comes to us that what, who was the user of it. And there is no way we can tie 
we can relate it the identifier to the email id until and unless we do it when we say that we are doing it if the data is the way we are doing it there's no way that we can tie the user so what gdpr says is is um there oh, yeah so there's a paragraph in gdpr that says a reiteration of uh, what is the consumer right this the it this includes that data subject side to get copies of their data and information on how it's being used and right to be forgotten known as data eraser so if the user wants it says that i want such type of data we can tell them that we don't have your data i don't know who you are there is no way that something can tie me to my data for this type of data i'm not talking about the booking data or etc but the things that i'm tracking there is no way that anyone can identify me so this system is still gdpr compliant so the questions and then we'll move to the thing which we call best flight we'll talk about random forest and how that random forest and uh, how we are uh, analyzing the user behavior on the go and we are reflecting the most relevant results to the users but before that any questions about this complete flow So, uh, how do you decide on your feature vectors? So, from what I see, uh, that was just a binary representation of what you had earlier, like one, two, three, and the other thing was just a binary representation. So, I was thinking more on the lines of if you could use the latitude and longitude, that would give a better sense of where the city is. Uh, but I mean, if you can just throw some light on how those features were, were being used for uh, for each city. So, you are talking about this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, when you're talking about multiple linear regressions, they are what they do is they are sort of mathematical equations, and you f try to figure out on a value. What happens is, suppose my uh, New York gets a value four, and it's more than three. So when I uh, do the computations, okay, when I do that, uh, when I is it will get give me a value which is not relevant to me right now because let's say it, if I multiply something by four and by three, it will give me different values. Same goes with latitudes and longitudes. So there is, I don't want the values. I don't want things like New York and Delhi making the changes in the type, the way I look to the data. These are uh, categorical data. I don't. Uh, these are yeah. These are essentially categorical data. These are not the data that I want to put IDs to. Does that make sense to you? But if we have a similar problem with this, how would, uh, so when you have uh, alpha x plus beta y or something like that, wouldn't it kind of give weight to Delhi, wouldn't the weight for Delhi be higher than New York or something like that? Yes, but okay. So uh, when you are saying Delhi, New York, Kampong, when I when my field was Kampong and it, it had the weight four and my Delhi had the weight three. When I put the Kampong, it will be higher weight in that equation. But what will happen here is Delhi has one, weight one and Kampong has weight one. If I put them equation separately, they will give me the same results. So Delhi and Kampong have values three and four. So when I compute with Delhi. And when I compute with Kampong, these are giving me different values. But that should not have been decided by that different values. Here, I have made the weight same. Delhi is also one, and Kampong is also one. And my equations go as they are. Um, OK, I'll, I'll just follow up with you. I am still not sure if I understand it correctly. So after the lecture, we can go back to it. Thanks. One 
so we can probably move to best flights how many everybody might be knowing what random forest is everybody might be knowing i assume it's a, it's a simple machine learning algorithm which creates lots of decision trees for you and creates a jungle of them for you the best flight what over the time we have realized it is that when user comes on the when user searches anything i'm i'm taking an example of flight because i know a little bit of domain here when user searches the flight there are different restrictions there are different rules and everybody want to know what's the best thing here and it's it cannot be made a, a, it it is not a directly a recommendation system because these are set of rules which you have to follow like i know a person who is having a child won't take a flight in the morning at 3 am a person who is traveling for a business travel will like to take a direct flight to the destination and won't take a one stop flight these are some of the things that makes every user unique so what we did is we took out the users past booking data we took the behavior of the every user and made tree cleft all of the trees in a single forest now when a user comes and tries to figure out that searches and then we every result set that comes on your page is analyzed through that system and then that one flight which is the best for you comes up so the thing is that this is a recommendation system but personalized recommendation system and it it doesn't directly gets into your booking history because you might be logged in or you might not be logged into the system it still gets the best results for you the difference here is the difference between when you purchase things from e-commerce websites what's happen is that you usually purchase things from e-commerce websites in next like say once a month but in travel you travel the travel cycle is of 18 months until that time your data has become irrelevant so the random forest is built in a way that we have the booking data of every person and then we have the particular tree which you have then we have your were the exact query which you have made and then the best match from the forest is made and only that tree is traversed so this is an example that how a personalized recommendation system can be built and analyzing the user behavior on the go and showing the results on the app in the real time so anyone having questions about this system sorry i was not able to make the slides because earlier my time was of more hours then it get reduced so there was some confusion here any questions okay i would like to bring you an hdpr uh, gdpr but i think it will not uh, fit in the remaining 5 minutes so maybe we'll take that offline um anybody else any generic questions Anybody wants to work with him? I don't know, whatever. <laughs> All right, well, Th thank you, everyone.